From CGTN headquarters in Beijing, this is The Hub with Wang Guan. Hello and welcome to the program. I'm Wang Guan in Beijing. As the spotlight shines on the Buao Forum for Asia Annual Conference 2023 in Buao, Hainan Province, can Asian wisdom offer a solution for global problems? The theme this year is An Uncertain World, Solidarity and Cooperation for Development Amid Challenges, which I indicates exploring how nations and organizations can work together, can cooperate better, and Chinese Premier Li Qiang's keynote address at the opening ceremony has details about China's proposals. Can China's opening up be the engine of world growth once again? And what are the prime challenges for common prosperity? To discuss all this and more, I'm joined in our Beijing studio by Li Yong, Senior Fellow at China Association of International Trade. He's also the Chief Researcher in D and C Think Tank. Uh, welcome to the program, uh, Mr. Li. Good to see you again. This is one of the first forums uh, the new Chinese Premier Li Yong attended. Uh, what are your takeaways from his speech at the Boal Forum this time around? I think probably uh, five points. One is about China, obviously, and China's attitudes, for example, uh, towards what is happening around the world and what China is going to do. And I, and I think the most important message is the opening up, uh, the, the continuity of this policy, which will have an impact on China's uh, economic rebound as well as the global economic uh, uh, recovery. And the second thing I think is about the long-term standing of the uh, China, of China uh, as a contributor to the world economy. And uh, I think he, he sent this message very clearly, in the sense that uh, you know China will continue to grow. China, you know, will continue to play the role of uh, of a responsible uh, uh, stakeholder. And the third is the as a kind of an active promoter of uh, true multilateralism and uh, you know that is very important because you know that based on that i think you know we will be able to establish you know the the desired solidarity and uh, and uh, you know the cooperation build around that is going to be yeah. successful and effective so that is very uh, important and the uh, the other thing is you know, the, I think the message is going to be about the resilience of the Chinese economy uh, under the condition, the current condition, and the new government. Particularly, I think there will be, uh, you know, proactive policies, okay, that will continue to support the resilience and, uh, as a consequence, the robustness of uh, the uh, supply chain, uh, you know, China. Uh, you know, as a part of the global supply chain. So that is going to be a kind of assurance, you know, to the audience as well as to, to the rest of the world. Yeah, thanks for this uh, uh, sum, up, um, sum up and summary. This forum, the uh, Boa Forum for Asia, is um, called Asian Doubles for many years. This year's conference is attended by many world leaders and foreign dignitaries, including um, Malaysian and Singapore um, head of state and head of government. Spanish Prime Minister Pedro Sanchez is there. Uh, many leaders from international organizations such as Cristina, Cristalina Gorgieva, the chief of IMF, mm -hmm. is there. Um, what do you make of their attendance there? Any notable statements, prediction about the Chinese economy that sticks out? Um, I think, you know, the first, I think, you know, it's about the gravity of this uh, forum. Uh, because you know this forum is about Asia, and Asia is the most net dynamic element in the global economy. And uh, more important that, than that, uh, this region you know, plays an important role uh, in terms of the global economy, not just in terms of population, size of economy, trade, et cetera, et cetera, in including the uh, global agenda of uh, green transformation and so on and so forth. So uh, through this platform, there are a lot of uh, interactions, and uh, there are collective voices. You know, particularly, uh, you know, those uh, business leaders, you know, uh, state leaders, you know, that are coming together. So those, uh, you know, important state leaders, their attendance is going to really uh, is going to be a kind of a mutual injection 
of important messages. You know, t for example, their attendance is an expression of their trust uh, in the stability of Asia, and they have their hope and their confidence in that. Okay, the, and at the same time, they were also wanted to get, you know, the kind of a positive feedback, you know, from uh, you know this forum. Uh, and obviously, you know, there are four modules, uh, uh, you know, in the in the forum, and each of them is going to really come up with, you know, some type of solutions, initiatives, and calls calls, you know, for the region and for the world to work together, you know, in the name of solidarity and cooperation and inclusive development, and so on and so forth. So that is is very important. You know, for the for the attending VIPs as well as you know the forum itself. A very important report released uh, from this year's Boao is called Asian Economic Outlook and Integration Process Annual Report 2023. Yeah. It calls Asia, quote unquote, a bright spot in the bleak uh, global economic landscape. Uh, to what extent do you share this assessment? Yes, I think you know we, we need to look at this. Uh, uh, conclusion or the statement in the context of the global economy, uh, you know, IMF, um, sort of uh, not really optimistic about the global uh, picture of the economic development. And but they did um, uh, revise this China projection. Yes, that's what I'm going to come to because, you know, Asia it has become a, a most dynamic and uh, their forecast for Asia, I mean, this report says the weighted real GDP is going to be 4.5%, uh, uh, better than last year's 42 So that, I think, is going to represent the momentum of growth, you know, the, the level of dynamism you know, being embedded you know, in the region. So that is, I think, is very, uh, uh, I, I think it is rel very relevant to the rest of the world. So uh, uh, that, I think, is going to be uh, the focus of attention and constitute the bright spot, OK? And, uh, and that there are other you know, cooperative initiatives, you know, including uh, in areas like you know, technological development, and green, uh, green transformation, and so on and so forth. So that underlines you know, the bright spots. So the report also said, you know, it is going to, to be the Asian moment. Mm -hmm. So that, you know, has a lot, I think that is the, uh, the most important thing to underscore, yeah. you know, the, uh, uh, the, you know the, 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 the wording of bright spots. Uh, definitely. Uh, a friend of mine who's also the uh, deputy governor of the Central Bank of Cambodia, yep. uh, Sirei She, Madame Sirei She, uh, she's here this time in Boao to discuss uh, you know, mutual payment systems. Uh, mm. That is to make payment systems, Alipay, WeChat, acceptable in Cambodia. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And like, uh, likewise, vice versa, making Cambodia digital payment systems available here in China. Um, so I just echoing what you've, you're saying. Um, yeah, I control cooperation. Yeah, I think you know very very important you know uh, in terms of digital uh, cooperation and eventually digital integration. I think that is going to inject uh, additional impetus because you know if we have a connected payment system, that is going to really facilitate a quicker flow yeah. of commodities. Uh, very quickly, the Chinese economy. IMF um, put its estimate, the latest one, yeah. at 5.2% instead of 4.8%. Uh, you share that optimism? Yes, I think you know, um, IMF is a, is a respected uh, uh, organization. You know, they have very strong research capability. You know, they have uh, very you know, uh, trustworthy you know, uh, type of a uh, model, uh, sophisticated model. models. Yeah, uh, I, I, and I'll, I mean trustworthy, uh, you know, uh, attitudes, uh, you know, in terms of their balanced views. So uh, when they upgrade yeah. uh, the, uh, the forecast for China's economy, that, which I think this is very significant because of, you know, their, their perspective, okay, and uh, the, their depth of diving into the data to come up with that kind of a conclusion is trustworthy and 
and it is also evidence of their uh, trust you know, uh, at different levels of, uh, you know, uh, in terms of China's policies being taken and, and uh, China, uh, you know, China's um, development, yeah. you know, trajectory. So uh, very much a kind of a, you know, agreement with what uh, China has been doing. I think, you know, that is very, very important. Yeah. In addition, you know, with that update, you know, they also uh, uh, express the confidence in terms of China's contribution to the world, you know, saying that, you know, contribution to the world the economy is going to be one yeah. third or even beyond that. Uh, I think it's, it's a kind of a positive uh, uh, analysis. And uh, actually, a, a full interview with uh, Kristalina Gorgieva, the IMF chief, is available on China Media Group. Uh, she was interviewed by my colleague, Bai Yansong. Um, you know, just Google for or, or Baidu that name and um, for the whole interview about her take on the Chinese economy and on the role of the Chinese economy in the global economic landscape. You've been watching The Hub with me here on CGTN. After a short break, we'll focus on democracy, actually the Democracy Summit in the United States. Stay with us. Welcome back. The Biden administration is holding the quote-unquote Summit for Democracy, the second of its kind in Washington, D.C. It is projected as Washington's laudable effort to boost democracy around the world. But does the West have a monopoly on the definition of democracy and whether or not it works? And how does the rest of the world look at Western-style democracy? For more discussions, I'm joined in Beijing by Rick Dunham, co-director of the Global Business Journalism Program at Tsinghua University. And in Tokyo, Japan, we have Emmanuel Pastrich, president of the Asia Institute. Um, let me start with you, Rick. We saw last year's democracy, the Summit for Democracy, held by Joe Biden. Um, many, uh, many experts argue that it was anything but a democracy um, around the world because of its notable absence by players in the region, for example, Cuba, Venezuela, Honduras, Nicaragua, Mexico, you name it. What do you think this second year uh, Summit for Democracy will be like? Well, I, it all depends on how you define democracy. And uh, I mean, I, I would say that not having Cuba there uh, is not a problem. Cuba is clearly not a democracy by any definition. Uh, Venezuela did elect its government, uh, even, even, the, even though it has become a dictatorship of sorts. But I think that, that, that misses the question. I think uh, democracy uh, in the sort of post-Second World War concept of Western liberal democracy is being challenged all over the world. And you have the biggest democracies in the world are India and Indonesia. I mean, the, the, the global south, as it's called, has more people living in uh, democracies than in Europe and in the United States. And so I think uh, that there's nothing wrong with the concept, pushing the concept that people should choose their own leaders. But I think that what is the proper form of democracy is a subject for discussion, not for dicta dictating. Yeah, a New York Times article on the summit was headlined as such, Biden's mm -hmm. defense of global democracy is tested by political turmoil. Rick, what do you think that political turmoil specifically referred to at this point? Well, there, there, there is turmoil in, in a number of ways. Uh, in, in, in a country like the United States, there is the loser of the last presidential election, Donald Trump, clear loser, but he is insisting that the election was stolen from him. He's not accepting the, the vote of the people. Uh, and, there are, and there are other moves in the United States, such as trying to make it harder to vote, uh, that challenge democracy. Uh, you have challenges to democracy in countries like India and countries like Turkey uh, and other democracies in the world where people are being arrested for criticizing the leaders. So there, there, there are challenges there. And there's a challenge because of the concept of free speech that you're also free to spread disinformation. And, and, and it's very messy in a democracy where, say, Russian uh, military intelligence can spread lies, uh, and it's perfectly legal uh, to do it. Uh, and so I think that, that democ democracy has a lot of stresses uh, inter internally and externally. Emmanuel, in Tokyo, let me turn to you. If you look at the major gauges of democracy that is delivering uh, effective uh, governance, delivering public goods that is improving livelihood and lives around the world, um, 
the West arguably failed on many accounts. If you look at COVID and their response in terms of public health provision and also uh, the capacity to deal with climate change, um, providing food for its people, uh, infrastructure, uh, many more areas uh, as you can name it. Uh, why do you think that is the case? Right. Well, when we talk about democracy or Western democracy, from the very beginning, it was a somewhat twisted uh, concept. In the United States, for example, was a very democratic society in the 19th century, unless, of course, you were African American or Native American, in which you were a slave or marginalized and had no democratic representation at all. This continues to be the case. There's large parts of the population which are excluded from any democratic process. But if we want to talk about these flaws in terms of health, you mentioned the United States is most expensive health service, uh, one of the most expensive in the world, uh, the breakdown of infrastructure. Uh, the underlying problem is that democracy in the sense of some political process has not been accompanied by a democratic economy. The economy has been concentrated increasingly, extremely in the last five years in the hands of a small group of private equity funds, multinational investment banks making decisions and concentrating uh, the government's focus on the interests of a very tiny part of the overall population. So if you don't have an economic system, this in a way goes back to the Chinese leader uh, Sun Yat-sen, of course, and his uh, three people's principle. I mean, the critical one uh, was a, a democratic economy, Min Sheng, this idea that you have to have an equality within the economy. Yeah, he said something and like the of the people for the people and by and the people, which the West, really I echoed include... um, the, the Western concept, uh, you know, exactly. Abraham Lincoln's um, uh, slogan of, um, you know, for the people, by the people, and of the people. But uh, Emmanuel, uh, let me ask you this. I, I personally you know, think for Sun a Chen's long time, Western democracy seemed to have worked. Uh, of course, there's this element of a pendulum effect, whereby left right. parties come to power, and then the uh, right wing parties come to power, and they, there's this thing called economic cycles. But regardless, right. Western style democracy seemed to have worked relatively well um, at the height of the Cold War in the 70s and 80s and even 90s. Uh, why do you think uh, liberal democracy um, right. seems to be losing some of its charm and momentum uh, in the coming into the first and second and now into the third decade of the 21st century? Well, I, I think I would have to give an answer which is not a standard one and may not be very popular. Uh, but during the Cold War, uh, the United States and these other uh, so-called liberal democracies were confronted by an alternative in China and in the Soviet Union of a socialist economy. Uh, socialist economies were not perfect, but they openly advocated uh, uh, a egalitarian society and they addressed class issues and the concentration of capital. And because of that alternative, it put pressure on the United States, Great Britain, France, and other countries to modify and to alleviate some of the contradictions within their society. So what we got in the sort of the height of the post-war American democratic society, liberal democratic system, uh, was something which was indirectly uh, impacted, I believe, by the existence of an alternative. And now we have much less of an alternative in that respect, although I think going forward, and, and China I think is playing a role in this, uh, showing that there are some alternatives. There are other ways to look at the economy, and most importantly, there are ways of defining democracy which go beyond the simplistic idea that one person can vote. Because if you don't have good information, if you don't get a good education, if you can't get to the polling place, then obviously it's not going to be a democracy in any meaningful way. Right. Uh, Rick, I want to ask you about, uh, you know, the American export of its style of democracy to the rest of the world. Uh, it seems to me like there has been this pendulum effect. Um, if you think about the 80s, when Ronald Reagan was president, uh, the CIA conducted covert operations across the Americas, across the Americas. 
and subverted regimes they consider illegitimate, uh, subverted regimes they don't like. And then uh, when uh, you know, uh, Bill Clinton was president, uh, he showed somewhat restraint. Uh, he was even criticized for not taking down bin Laden earlier. And then when George Bush came to power, there was this, of course, war in, in Iraq and Afghanistan. And then when Obama took office, uh, there was uh, you know, uh, you know, uh, withdrawal of forces from those overseas interventions. Uh, what do you think will happen next now that Joe Biden is president? Yeah. Well, I agree with your concept here of pendulums, but I, I think we need to divide it into two. One is the idea of the export, the idealistic exporting of American style democracy. And that goes back 100 years to President Wilson after the First World War and the whole, the whole idea of making the world safe for democracy, uh, which was really an American concept that even the French and the British after the First World War thought was idealistic as they wanted to carve up uh, the Middle East uh, and India. Uh, and, and, and it continued with George Bush. George Bush after September 11th, after taking down the governments of Afghanistan and Iraq, which were, was easy militarily. But you could see the disaster, the vacuum after that. The idea of exporting American-style democracy there did not work. The Arab Spring uh, that, that, that overthrew the government of Egypt, and look what happened. You had a populist uh, Islamic government at, that was overthrown by a military uh, regime. So anyway, that just doesn't work. You cannot apply the standards of American-style democracy everywhere in the world. Uh, but then there's also the issue of interference. And you're right, there are cycles going back with US interference. And you could go back to the 19, late 1940s uh, in, in Europe and, uh, and, uh, and in, in Iran in the 1950s, as well as what you were saying in the 60s, 70s, and 80s uh, in Central America and Africa. Um, there has been less of that. And now uh, Russia is playing a lot of the same role that the United States used to play uh, in uh, interfering in, in the uh, in, in, in local uh, political uh, po political situations around the world, but I think I think Joe Biden is not one who is uh, it, it would would go to this kind of covert subversion of democracy. Uh, he's not an idealist like uh, like like George Bush and like Woodrow Wilson. I think he's much more realistic, sort of in the Nixonian way, uh, real politic in the in the world. But the challenges are new, and the question is whether an old man like Joe Biden is up to those new challenges of the world. Yeah, um, Emmanuel, if you look at America's China policy, there is an ideological flavor to it, right? Uh, one of the most cited uh, reasons or rationale for U.S. containment policy vis-a-vis uh, -vis China was that China is not or has not turned into a Western-style democracy. Um, and, you know, ideological okay. differences yeah. and political uh, differences in political systems were often cited. Um, and recently, the, U the House passed a bill unanimously to pursue stripping China of its developing country status. Uh, what do you make of all this? Right. Well, uh, China has become the political uh, hot button in the United States. In fact, almost every seminar uh, at a think tank in Washington, D.C. refers to China at some level or another. And this is... To, to some degree related to the degree to which the American and Chinese economies have been uh, so integrated that everything in China becomes an America issue. Uh, but I think the psychology behind this strategy is basically projection, that there are these sort of unspeakable contradictions and problems and cruelty in American society that are so painful to watch that it's easier to just project it uh, onto China. I, I see this particularly on the question of surveillance and the growth of a police state, that American developments in the use of surveillance technology to track people and to consolidate uh, information and, uh, and to use it against individuals uh, is something that can't be addressed in American press very well. So instead, they say, well, it's China. All these terrible things are done by China. And that, uh, it's, it's, it, it, it makes a global problem uh, seem as if it all or originates in China. 
And this reminds me very much of what has been done in the past, efforts to sort of blame, uh, of course, the Chinese in the 19th century, the Jews in the early 20th century, uh, and then, of course, in the, in the Cold War, to blame uh, the Soviet Union for, for everything. It's a very standard, neat, but wrong approach. Yeah, Emmanuel, uh, let me ask you this. Last weekend, the China Development Forum was held here in Beijing. Very different sentiment uh, coming out of that meeting. Business leaders from the U.S. and around the world interacted with their Chinese counterparts. Uh, they met with senior Chinese policymakers uh, and uh, you know, highlighted the importance and necessity of cooperation, many consensus reached. Um, how do you contrast that with the political atmosphere uh, in Washington? Right. Well, I think first, uh, Washington, D.C. doesn't really represent the United States all that well. It's a very specific uh, economy unto itself. Uh, and the main reason for that gap, which you uh, identify there, has to do with the explosion of the military industrial complex, that so much of the budget in Washington has to do with weapon systems. And the only way to justify these weapon systems is to postulate China as an adversary. Otherwise, you can't get those budgets. So this has distorted the entire political and sort of international diplomatic uh, lens. Everything has to justify some weapon system. It, I find it very tragic because as an American, I think there are great strengths in the American uh, political, uh, intellectual tradition, and yes, even in democracy from the 19th century, America offered uh, a contribution to the world, but it doesn't belong to the United States. And distorting it in order to justify budgets, military budgets with China as, a, as the enemy uh, is truly a tragic uh, and lamentable uh, conclusion. Yeah, you know, there are so many issues we want to get to. For example, uh, the Taiwan leader Tsai Ing-wen's uh, controversial trip to Central America. Uh, with a stop uh, in the United States where unconfirmed reports say that she's going to meet with House Speaker Kevin McCarthy, which of course uh, is considered by Beijing as another provocation, if you remember, uh, then Speaker Nancy Pelosi's very controversial visit to the island of Taiwan, uh, which we considered a province last year. Um, but in the interest of time, we'll have to leave it there. Emmanuel, thank you so much. And Rick, thank you as always. It's great to have both of you with us. Thank you. And that will do it for this edition of The Hub on CGTN. Thank you so much for tuning in. Our news coverage continues.